So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Klein and Dr. Lewis, uh, welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, please introduce yourselves and we look forward to your information. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lewis, would you like to go first? Sure, I'm Linda Lewis. I am the uh, Butte County Epidemiologist and Communicable Disease Controller, and I have been in that position in one shape or another since uh, 2005. Uh, prior to that, I've worked with Indian Health Service and uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and I also uh, am a lecturer there at CSUC um, in epidemiology. Okay, and I'm Troy Klein. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Chico State. Um, I've been in this position since 2013. Um, prior to taking a position here, I completed graduate school, a PhD um, in immunology at Ohio State University and did a postdoctoral research fellowship at St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis. Um, both at Ohio State and at St. Jude, my research uh, focused on aspects of the immune response to respiratory pathogens. I focused on influenza virus. My research here at Chico State continues to focus on influenza viruses, but I've shifted interests to look more at the animal pathogen interface. I'm studying avian influenza virus and its natural waterfowl host. And uh, the way Dr. Lewis and I have decided to do this today, we're going to tag team and um, pass screen sharing back and forth to each other as we both cover different aspects of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 infection and COVID-19. So I'm going to share this screen. I wanna start by just giving a very brief background on how vaccines work and what the goal of vaccination is. Currently in the United States, there are three vaccines that are authorized for emergency use probably heard of these vaccines, Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, and Pfizer. Pfizer is expected in the next couple of weeks, I believe by the end of May, to uh, go back to the FDA and seek full licensure and approval um, for their vaccine. The technologies or platforms used to develop these three vaccines are, are new um, in the case of Moderna and Pfizer meaning this is the first time a vaccine using these mRNA technologies have been authorized for use in the United States or anywhere, um, or uncommon. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, Johnson there is one other vaccine in the world that uses a similar technology, um, uh, but that's an Ebola virus vaccine uh, that few, if any, people in the United States have gotten. The fact that these technologies and platforms are new does not mean that the vaccines are untested. They've been rigorously tested and reviewed for safety and efficacy. And even though the technologies are new, the basic mechanism of protection, the goal of the vaccine remains the same. And so the picture here is showing um, how vaccines work. Um, so what we do for vaccination is we expose our body, our immune cells to a dead or weakened version this is how most vaccines work um, of a virus um, for, for the vaccines, these mRNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer. It's not a dead or a weakened version of the virus. There's no virus at all. It's just um, the, the genetic instructions for a piece of the virus that we're exposing ourselves to with the vaccine. That small scale infection um, or exposure to a piece of a virus uh, raises our body's um, alarm system. We see a piece of something that is foreign, that looks dangerous to us, and so our immune system reacts. Um, an important part of vaccine efficacy is the production of antibodies. Uh, antibodies are made by B cells. And so those antibodies will be created and they'll go out and get educated and informed on this, um, what looks to them like a threat. But some of those B cells and those antibodies will stick around. And if we're naturally exposed to the live real world virus or pathogen six months down the line, a year down the line, um, hopefully those B cells and antibodies are still there and they can respond quickly in order to prevent infection or prevent disease. Linda, I'm gonna pass it over to you to talk about herd immunity.
Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about herd immunity, and that's the concept that um, we want to look not just at the individual, but the entire community. It's also called community immunity um, for those who don't like the animal reference. And I really like this diagram because it shows that although um, not everyone has an umbrella, everyone is protected by the umbrella. So it's a, it's a good analogy. Oops. So herd immunity basically is when enough of the population is immunized to stop transmission in that, in that community or in that population. And that allows the small number of people who cannot be vaccinated because maybe they have severe allergies to the vaccine or a component of it. Maybe they're uh, infants, so they're too young to be vaccinated, or maybe they have specific medical conditions that, um, for which a uh, vaccine is contraindicated. Um, so we want to we want to protect those vulnerable people by having the people around them vaccinated. Um, I think an important concept is that herd immunity has never been achieved only through natural um, infection. You just never reach the the threshold for that through natural infection. So you always uh, need to think about vaccination when you're trying to achieve herd immunity. And the necessary coverage uh, for a vaccine in a population is dependent on the virus, depends on how infectious that virus is. And we know that the, the what we call the wild type SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is the causative virus for COVID, uh, we know the wild type on average will infect 2.6 persons. One infected person will infect 2.6 other people. Um, that's on average. So one person may not infect anybody and another person may infect 20 people, but on average 2.6. For that level, um, we need to vaccinate at least 62% of the population to achieve that herd immunity. When we look at the variants, um, particularly B117 um, is 50% more transmissible. So that means instead of one infected person giving it to 2.6 other people, they will give it to 3.9 other people, essentially four other people. At that level, we need almost 75% of the population to be vaccinated to confer herd immunity. And this diagram shows um, if you have a population who's completely non-immune, right? They haven't been exposed, they haven't been vaccinated. It shows how transmission can spread quickly. So you have one infected person here in red, they share their virus with four other people, three of those get sick. This person's now recovered, they're no longer infectious, but each of the people that they in um, infected can then share with four other people. And so pretty quickly, you have rapid spread throughout the community. Now in the lower diagram, it shows what happens when 70% of the population is immune. So they've reached a, a level of herd immunity. So this one person, uh, exposes four other people, but three of those shown in yellow are protected because they are either immunized or they were uh, naturally infected. So only one person um, becomes ill from that exposure. And then that one person is actually not around any other uh, vulnerable people. So they're, they essentially are a dead end for the virus. The virus can't continue to spread. And these other people here um, become protected because they're surrounded by people who are um, immunized. So that's the, that's the concept behind herd immunity and what, what's meant by it. And I think um, what's been interesting with the SARS-CoV virus is that the data suggests so far that the vaccines actually confer a more robust immunity against than natural infection, especially against um, virus variants. So even if people have been previously infected, uh, they, it's still, um, oops, sorry. It's still a good idea for them to um, go ahead and get vaccinated. So what we know, herd immunity can only be achieved uh, with the use of vaccine, right? And 
we do know that per certain persons in our population are less likely to mount a robust immune response. So people who are very old, people who are severely immunocompromised, their immune systems may not respond as well as I, it would be ideal to the vaccine. However, if those people can get vaccinated and they do get vaccinated, if they get ill, the illness is much less likely to be as severe. So they get kind of partial protection. And like my backdrop shows here, a uh, vaccine is one aspect of a lot of layers of protection. And so until we get herd immunity, um, all those non-pharmaceutical interventions, what we call NPIs, masks, physical distancing, hand washing, they're still important um, at some level. So it's a dial, it's not a light switch. Things we don't yet know is we don't know whether this vaccine protects um, against asymptomatic transmission. We know it's very, very effective against illness, um, protecting against illness, but um, we're still learning about asymptomatic transmission. Um, we don't know how long immunity will last once a person is vaccinated or even has natural infection. And we don't know whether boosters will be required. We think they probably will be. Um, we don't know how often, uh, hopefully less often than influenza. So how are we doing in Butte County? So we have, like most of the, all of the US, we've, we've um, uh, launched a massive uh, vaccination effort. Um, and to date, we have vac fully vaccinated 33% of our county population. Our goal is roughly 75%. That's going to change a bit based on what variants are circulating. But at this point, 75% is a good approximation for a goal. Um, and again, things, things are not all, all good or all bad. So even if we can't reach that 75%, the closer we get, the more we'll be able to suppress tr transmission and outbreaks and protect the very vulnerable among us. If we look at um, fully vaccinated and partly vaccinated, because two of our three vaccines require a two-dose series, um, we have another almost 9% that have gotten the first dose of a two-dose series. So that puts us at um, almost 42% um, vaccinated. And we're shifting now from a mass vaccination approach to um, smaller, uh, more accessible um, uh, approaches. And then it's back to you, Troy. I will stop my sharing. Okay, so <clears throat> something that we forgot to mention at the beginning. If anything that one of us says, either Dr. Lewis or myself, prompts a question, feel free to type your questions into the chat. Um, uh, if, if you'd like, Dr. Lewis and I are both willing to be interrupted if you wanna unmute yourself um, to ask a question. So maybe on your participants uh, you know, profile, if you just raise your hand or, or indicate somehow that you wanna ask a question vocally, um, Adrian, maybe you could monitor that as well and, and interrupt me um, if somebody has a question. So these vaccines that are being used against COVID-19, um, again, though they all employ slightly different platforms of technology, the target is the same. So all of the vaccines that are authorized for use target this um, spike protein of uh, the virus, of the coronavirus. This is the piece of the virus that we are exposing our immune system to. And this is the piece of the virus then that we're generating antibodies B cells, T cells against. So if we see the real virus, um, we'll see that our, our cells will see that spike protein and be able to attack it and protect us. Viruses replicate uh, pretty quickly. And so they're always changing, they're always mutating. And the normal process of virus replication inside a cell encourages mutation. There's an evolutionary advantage for viruses to mutate frequently. And these mutations give rise to variants, which may um, differ in important ways from the virus that was originally circulating and, and originally isolated. So the emergence of viral variants, which we're hearing a lot about, 
is normal, it's expected, but it's also something to keep an eye on and it's something that may uh, be a concern. So um, one thing we know is that increased spread and transmission of a virus in a community will increase the likelihood of mutation because there are more opportunities, more hosts, and more opportunities for the virus to uh, acquire these mutations that may be beneficial in terms of transmissibility or in terms of uh, a virus's ability to hide from our immune system, even hide from the antibodies that are elicited from a vaccine. So several variants of concern are already distributed pretty widely across the world. And in just a second, Dr. Lewis is going to talk about the variants that have been detected here in Butte County. How effective are the current vaccines against these variants? So what I'm showing here is the efficacy of the current vaccines against both the original um, virus that was circulating and still is circulating, as well as how effective are the vaccines against, um, there are more than these three variants that are of concern, but these three are uh, the three that are most talked about. So what you'll notice is that um, vaccine-induced antibody levels, which is specifically what the authors of this paper are referring to, vaccine-induced antibody levels are reduced against two of the three variants, B1351 and P1. However, though antibody levels are reduced, right, so you, you get vaccinated, antibody levels that are generated are reduced against these two variants, but the vaccines are still expected to be effective. That means in a real world situation, maybe you've got fewer antibodies, but you're still protected from disease, severe disease and, and death if you were to be infected with one of these variants, All right? So in addition to antibodies, T cells and other parts of the immune system are generated and activated in response to vaccination as well. So even though antibody levels may be slightly lower, um, T cells may still be activated. And that may be what's protecting against variants, um, even though antibody levels are slightly lower. So one thing I think is important to mention, Dr. Lewis actually um, clued me into a study very recently published. Dr. Lewis talked about about 9% of Butte County residents are partly immunized. So they've gotten one of their two doses. This recent study that came out indicated that people who are um, partly vaccinated and who have not been naturally infected um, with the coronavirus are less uh, likely to be protected, may be, uh, may, may be less likely to be protected against the variants um, than those who have, have multiple exposures, uh, either through vaccination or through infection and vaccination. All right, so the take home message should be, um, if you're partly vaccinated, make sure you get that second appointment and keep that second appointment to complete your, your vaccination regimen so that you can get full protection against uh, the virus variants that are circulating. So, um, what one, one other thing I think should be said is, although antibody levels elicited by the vaccine against these variants are reduced, that's not uh, a reason to think that you should put off vaccination because you don't think the vaccines are effective against the variants. They are effective against the variants. And in fact, you should be more eager to get a vaccine knowing this because the emergence of new variants is tied to the rate of virus transmission in the community. And so the best way to win the race against the emergence of new viral variants and the continued transmission of these variants is to vaccinate as many people as we can, as quickly as we can, to halt community spread of all of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants that are circulating. Thanks, Troy. And yeah, uh, thanks for mentioning that, Troy. I think that often gets sort of lost in the weeds is that um, one of the really important reasons to get vaccinated and to, to use face coverings and distancing and all is that 
the more we allow this virus to spread, the more likely are we are to get variants and possibly a variant that is even uh, worse than the ones we have already circulating. I want to take a minute to uh, answer Sarah's question. Um, she asked, uh, what, are, what are boosts? So when we talk about vaccination, there's typically uh, an initial one vaccine or series of vaccine that a person needs to uh, reach immunity. Um, in the case of COVID, we have one vaccine that's a single dose, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and then we have the Pfizer and Moderna, which are each a two-dose series. So once you complete uh, the initial um, schedule for that vaccine, uh, for, some, for many of our vaccines, we need what we call boosters. So it's essentially another dose of the same vaccine. In COVID, they may reformulate it slightly to cover a variant. Um, and and it's, so it's a booster, like your tetanus shots or, when, or getting a second measles vaccine um, or getting your annual flu vaccine, right? So every year we get a, essentially a booster of the flu vaccine. Um, so that's what we're not sure. We think based on other coronaviruses that this is not likely to uh, either natural infection or vaccine is not likely to give us lifelong immunity. So uh, most likely we'll need boosters uh, we just don't know it at what cadence that will be. So when we talk about vaccine effectiveness um, and breakthroughs, um, I think first we, we have to think about how we define vaccine effectiveness. And there's multiple ways of defining that. So we can look at, does the vaccine prevent infection? Does the vaccine prevent illness? Does the vaccine prevent serious disease and hospitalizations? And does the vaccine prevent deaths? And those are four separate measures. When they test vaccines generally, and when they tested the COVID vaccines, they're really looking at preventing illness and serious disease, hospitalization, and death, right? Because illness, we all want to prevent illness. Um, it has a, an economic and human impact. And we definitely want to prevent um, deaths and serious disease and hospitalizations, and particularly with COVID, where uh, if a localized outbreak becomes large enough, it can overrun the ability of our healthcare systems to, um, to cope with it. And we saw that in New York City, and we're seeing that now in India and other countries in the world. So we really want to avoid that because then we not only lose people to COVID, we lose people to other uh, conditions because the healthcare capacity is not there to attend to them. What, what we tend not to look at as closely until after a vaccine is actually um, rolled out um, and, and put into use is whether or not it prevents infection. Um, and that is, but that is a, also a really important um, question, and we're trying to answer that now, not only how well it prevents the virus from invading our bodies, but does it prevent us from shedding that virus and sharing it with other people? So I might get vaccinated and I'm protected. I am vaccinated fully. Um, if I get exposed, do I get infected? And then the second question, if I get infected, um, do I get am I able to shed that virus and share it with other people? And that's the question we're trying to answer right now through uh, multiple studies. Um, that's why, and you, you saw at first, uh, the recommendation was if you are vaccinated, still wear your mask. We're learning more that it uh, seems to be very unlikely that fully vaccinated people can transmit. So there's more um, loosening of that guidance and, and lightening up on the mask requirements if people are fully vaccinated. So how do our COVID vaccines measure up? Well, nothing's 100%. I think uh, we need to address that right away. We do expect some people who are fully vaccinated who otherwise should be vaccine responders may not be protected. Um, this, 
the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, especially are very, very uh, good vaccines, probably 94% effective at preventing illness. Um, all of the vaccines are near close to 100% effective at, at preventing uh, serious illness and death. So ICU stays and deaths, um, which is really fantastic. Um, but we know that even with a, a vaccine that's 94% effective, that means six people out of every 100 may still get ill with COVID, even though they're fully vaccinated. Um, we expect that. Um, their illness is likely to be far less severe than it would have been if they were unvaccinated. Um, and we're tracking, um, as, as Troy showed, we're looking at uh, the effect of um, the variants on vaccine effectiveness. And so with the P1 and the B1351 variant, uh, there is some reduction based on antibodies. Um, but if you're starting at 94%, effective and you have a 24, a 20% 20 reduction, you still have a very effective vaccine that's going to, that's going to make a, a big dent in this. And then I'm going to just segue in here to the variants. Um, the graph is, I'll walk you through, this is a graph that's by month, the percent of those viruses that were sequenced in each for each of the different um, variants. So of all those that were sequenced, um, how many were uh, B1427, 1429 in the blue, those are what we call our West Coast variants. Um, they initially in California where they originated were um, the predominant uh, variant, um, but that has now been overtaken by in the red here, you see the B117 variant, which is the more transmissible one. Um, that is now um, our major variant. It counts for over 41% of, of, of viruses sequenced in California. Um, and then you have a, a couple others creeping up here. Um, the surveillance for these variances is, is ramping up. We're getting, we're testing more and more uh, uh, virus samples every, every day. Um, we have uh, limited testing done here so far in Butte County, uh, but we have detected the B117 uh, based on neighboring counties. Um, I would say it's, uh, I would assume that the West Coast variants are also circulating in Butte. We just have not um, uh, sequenced them yet, but I, I would assume that they are here. And then um, there are, it is very easy now to get a vaccine. Um, in fact, Chico State is offering an on-campus vaccine clinic. This is only for um, faculty, students, and staff um, on uh, next Tuesday. And there's sign up information here. And also, if you go to the Butte County website, there is a long list of places where you can receive the vaccine. You can choose which vaccine you would like to get uh, because the locations list uh, the vaccines that they offer. Um, you can get them at many pharmacies, directly sign up with the pharmacy through our website or with the pharmacy. Um, or you can use the state system, which is uh, called My Turn, and sign up for vaccine, whatever is most convenient for you. And then I just included, um, there, there is a plethora of information out there. Um, I, so I thought I would uh, include some, some useful and reputable links. Um, you can always go to our our public health website to see the, the local situation and get resources. The California Department of Public Health has some uh, excellent resources and also tracking what's happening in California. CDC, of course. And then um, this last link is one of many um, uh, links that 
talks about the virus and the variants and the uh, epidemiology um, in our country as well as globally. So hopefully those will be helpful to you. Any questions? So feel free to put questions in the chat if you'd like, um, or you can you can speak up. We're hoping something that we said today prompted a question, but your questions don't have to be limited to just the topics and issues we discussed here. If you have a question or you've heard questions from others, um, something you've heard or read that you want to know more about, feel free to ask questions about that as well. I'm gonna... If you want to raise your hand. Oh. Go ahead, Jean. Okay, because it's kind of a long question and I'm not sure whether this is the right place for it, but um, my, my teenager um, just got their second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, but the only the second dose was scheduled through the my turn. And now we keep getting texts saying, you haven't received your second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. How long are we gonna get those? I, I don't know how to stop it. I... Um, yeah, we, I'm making sure I'm unmuted here. You all can hear me, right? Yeah. 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 Um, we have heard that from other people too. Um, I'm happy to talk to our vaccine team and see if there's a way that you can you can turn that off. Is is there not an opt out in that text message? Um, there is a reply stop to cancel. Um, but I, I guess just for for record keeping, as far as the the big picture of things, it would be nice to know or for the records to show that that really is a second dose and wasn't a first dose with a non-second dose, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, so you want to be in that, uh, the, the red part of that uh, graph, right? Not in the, in the yellow part. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat and feel free to email me and I will see what our county uh, vaccine team uh, has to say. I do know they have dealt with this issue before, um, but I can't say off the top of my head what the solution is. Great. Thank you. And then I see a question in the chat about nursing home workers not obligated to get the vaccine. So this is a great question. And I and right now it it has to do with how the vaccine is um, is its status with the FDA. So right now the vaccines are all under an emergency use authorization. And it's my understanding that they nobody can require vaccine of someone when it's an, um, under an emergency use authorization. When it's approved, then they can do that. They can make that a, a job requirement. Um, and, and yeah, hopefully we'll see. It, it, it's frustrating. I work a lot with the uh, skilled nursing homes and there's so much disinformation and misinformation out there that we, we are not achieving uh, as high a vaccination rate um, among some healthcare workers as we would like. Yeah, this is an issue at the university too. So I'm sure if you have any connections to the university, you'll have heard that uh, the, the CSU campuses are planning to require vaccination for students, staff, faculty returning to a campus for fall semester. Um, this is contingent upon, or this, this policy decision would be contingent upon uh, one of the three vaccines that are currently authorized for emergency use being fully approved by the FDA, which Pfizer is expected to go to the FDA um, and give an update on their efficacy data, hoping to uh, get full approval. Uh, at which point, I, I imagine, I don't interface with the policy and, and legislation on this, but I imagine at that point, the legality of requiring a vaccine becomes uh, more open. Um, there's a question in the chat from Ramona about, uh, Ramona wants to know more about blood clotting disorders. So actually, um, 
I don't know, Ramona, but this is the perfect question. And I actually had prepared to say something about this. So let me share my screen one more time and bring up that question. Uh, because this is something that's been in the news a lot recently. Um, so how concerned should you be? Should you be concerned about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? So the issue was, um, it was observed that administration of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was associated with a risk of a potentially serious blood clotting issue. This is a very rare event. And so the reason this was not caught in the clinical trials is because clinical trials, and not just for these vaccines, but in general, clinical trials, phase three trials deal in the tens of thousands of people, 30, 40, 50,000 trial participants. If you have an event that is on the order of uh, one in a million, the likelihood of you seeing that severe side effect in a clinical trial is very, very, very low. Um, you wouldn't expect to see it. So it was only after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine began to be administered to more and more people that this side effect was observed, right? So the observation of this clotting side effect after the vaccine was given emergency use, emergency use authorization is not an argument that the vaccine, uh, the clinical trials weren't rigorous enough or the review was not good enough. All right, so that's um, get that out of the way first. So administration of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine was paused on April 13th um, for the FDA to uh, to review the data um, to see um, uh, if there were going to be more cases of this potentially severe blood clotting issue um, arise, so they could get a better grasp on how how serious is this and how frequently does this occur. April 25th, the CDC recommended um, resuming the use of the Johnson & Johnson in the vaccine. Um, it turns out all incidents of blood clotting were in women between the ages of 18 to 49, right? So if you don't fall under that demographic, um, you can have much less concern about this. If you are in that demographic or have a friend or loved one who's in that demographic, then keep listening. If you were between the ages of 18 and 49, the chance of clotting is somewhere between four and seven in a million. So a million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine in women of this age group, we can expect about four to seven cases of this potentially serious blood clotting issue. Women over the age of 50, less than one in a million. So let's get some perspective on what that means. If every American woman, I, I went and looked at the, the breakdown of, of people in this country, how many, there, how many people are there in these age groups? If every American woman over the age of 18 was given the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we could only expect about 500 people to experience the side effect. All right, putting that in perspective, um, birth control pills, women's contraceptives are associated with this blood clotting issue as well. And in fact, um, it's 71 times more likely to occur with birth control pills than with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So that's some perspective. Now, this doesn't mean that um, we're not concerned about those potentially 500 people that could experience this um, severe side effect. But in, in public health and medicine, we, we always have to weigh the benefits against the risks. And in this case, the data came back quite clearly that the vaccine overall um, was very, very safe. In fact, if you are infected naturally with this virus and have COVID-19, the blood clotting um, concern is still there. And in fact, it's more likely about 40 in a million are the chances that with natural infection, you will experience this blood clotting issue. So in that light, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine actually can be seen as lowering your risk of blood clotting um, compared to continuing to have yourself be unprotected from this virus. Um, but I want to put this disclaimer, right? So hopefully this, um, this information answers your question and maybe resolves some concerns about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, but if you or someone you know has reason to suspect or believe um, that you might um, have a, a condition that could put you at risk for this blood clotting issue, 
then definitely consult with your physician uh, prior to your vaccination appointment if you have any of those concerns or if you just have questions um, and you want some uh, some more peace of mind about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine if that's the one you're going to get um, ask questions of your physicians before you get your shot make sure you have all of your questions answered before you uh, before you make the decision thanks Troy um, we have Cody uh, with their hand raised can you uh, Cody you're welcome to unmute and ask your question sure this is for uh... Um, for Linda Lewis. So I have um, a family member who's in administration at the Butte County Office of Education, and they currently have this guidance from Butte County Public Health for schools that uh, once you're vaccinated, the quarantine procedures are, uh, are modified so that you don't have to go into a full 14-day quarantine. Um, but after three months after vaccination, that modified quarantine is uh, turned around and you it's as if you're not vaccinated anymore you have to go into that 14 day quarantine three months after vaccination so is this just uh has this just not been updated yet or is there a rationale behind that yes three so this yeah thanks for the question this is a, a great example of how uh, guidance changes as we learn more so when the vaccine was first um available and we weren't sure the duration of the immunity, um, the CDC and CDPH, the, the uh, state health department, um, issued those guidelines of 90 days, similar to 90 days post-infection. So if con considering that within those 90 days, we were very sure people were not subject to um, becoming reinfected. Um, that 90 days, um, has been dropped. So one of the challenges is when there's constantly new guidance is keeping up with the, the most recent one. So I would encourage them to reach out to our team and, uh, and get the latest guidance. Oh, thank you. I'll make yeah. sure to do that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And then I wanted to address a uh, point in the uh, discussion from Stephanie, and Stephanie, thank you uh, for raising this, is um, we, we do need to, we do need to, Stephanie says, I, I just want to share a couple of lay articles, which she did, thank you. Um, if we don't know why people are saying no to vaccines, we can't help educate and change their perspective, and that's exactly right. We need to understand where that hesitancy comes from. Uh, for different people is very different reasons. And I tend to look at it, and in public health, we tend to look at it as, you know, there are a spectrum of people and we're trying to move the middle. There are people who are very entrenched in their belief systems. And no matter what you do, they're unlikely to ever accept any vaccine. Um, but there's all these people in between. And so if, if we can uh, address the concerns, and many of those are very valid concerns um, about the vaccine, um, then maybe we can move that middle and at least approach, if not attain, herd immunity. And the more people who are vaccinated, the fewer deaths we're going to have, the, the fewer uh, of our family members in uh, ICU, um, and the fewer times our kids have to be sent home from school because there's been an exposure. So, um, and on that lines, there was also a question about, I don't know if you wanna address this one, Troy, have these vaccines undergone phase three trials yet? They, they absolutely have. Moderna, yeah. Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson all completed their phase three clinical trials. This, th these are the data that the FDA required in order to give, to grant emergency use authorization. You don't get emergency use authorization without phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Um, and in fact, the phase three clinical trials that were used uh, to, to acquire emergency use authorization were um, robust, both in terms of safety and efficacy. 
Um, so the, the safety, the review of the safety data um, that went into the emergency use authorization was the same as uh, if these companies had come for full approval. The efficacy data is where that difference lies between emergency use authorization and full approval. Um, so why these vaccines had not yet been given full approval is because they did not have sufficient data for the FDA to know how long will protection last. So clearly, as more vaccine doses are given um, and time passes, um, these companies are getting more and more data on how long immunity lasts. And this is why Pfizer is going back for full approval. But yeah, the answer to Jim's question is they have all undergone phase three clinical trials. Thank you, Troy. And I'll add to that that you know, not only, well, two things. One is I think there's a common misperception that these vaccines were rushed. And because they were truly rolled out sooner than any vaccine we've ever had. Um, it's important to know that it was not the tr clinical trials that were rushed. The phase one, two, and three process was not rushed. What was rushed was instead of waiting for that phase three trial to be over and the vaccine to be granted emergency use authorization before they began manufacturing. They, the companies began manufacturing when they began studying these vaccines so that the minute that they were authorized, they had doses available. Um, so that's, that's why these were so much more quickly available than other vaccines. It wasn't that the safety and efficacy part was rushed. Um, and then we don't stop. And the, the finding of a, a clotting issue with the J&J &J vaccine is an example of that. We continue to collect data on vaccine adverse events after the emergency use authorization is granted. So, and anybody can report those. So, the person who gets the vaccine can report it through CDC's Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. And also there's a second uh, method of reporting. If, if you all got, any of you who got vaccinated probably got an invite to enroll in, uh, I forget what they called it, but it's a text-based um, app. They send you messages checking in on your, your uh, side effects um, at, right after you get the vaccine and it continues for a month or two afterwards. Um, so these are being um, tracked very closely and the, the clotting issue was picked up with the J&J &J vaccine. Um, so this is ongoing. This not just you get the authorization and then you stop looking for things. Um, we continue to look for vaccine adverse events as well as um, efficacy. So um, I'm, I know I'm skipping over a couple of things here and, and we'll get back to it, but um, Jim's asking if these phase three results are published. This, yeah, the, the data that the FDA reviewed are publicly accessible and um, I've got a link actually in a different PowerPoint slide, so I'll look for it and post it here in the chat. I've got a link to the phase three data and the report that Johnson and Johnson gave to the FDA. Um, so I, I'll leave that there in the chat if Jim or anybody else wants to see that. Thank you. I just went back. There's another uh, question in the chat. Do immunizations affect or even take over the body's normal antibody production? Um, is there a chance of immunizations taking over and weakening the antibodies already present in our bodies? Um, no, so yeah, there, there is no, there are no data that would suggest that the immunizations are affecting our body's normal ability to, to generate an immune response against something else that we may be exposed to, um, or to affect, uh, the B cells and the antibodies that we generated to prior vaccinations. So, uh, yeah, in that, in that regard. Uh, these vaccines don't impact your your immune memory or your history of other exposures. And then there's a question of why isn't uh, the clotting an issue for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines? 
Um, I don't know if you want to handle that, Troy, or. Um, hold on. All right, so there's that link to the FDA phase three. Um, I don't know the answer to the why. Um, I, I just, I know that Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have not been associated with an increased risk of this clotting condition. I don't know why that they're not, but I also don't know if the why the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is linked to a blood clotting issue is answered either. So until uh, researchers figure out why the Johnson and Johnson vaccine may be causing this, uh, and to my knowledge, that question hasn't been answered then it, it's diff it will be harder to answer why don't the other vaccines cause the same issue. Yeah, and I, I can just add to that, the, the way these, ma these vaccines are, are designed is very different. So the Pfizer and the Moderna are very close, they're mRNA vaccines. The Johnson & Johnson is, uh, is a completely different type of vaccine. Um, and it is more similar to the AstraZeneca vaccine that's used in uh, Europe and other parts of the world, which has also been uh, linked to very, very rare um, similar clotting disorder. So um, they think it's, uh, it has to do with the design of the vaccine. They're basically built on an adenovirus uh, platform. Sarah's question is, would you recommend the Moderna or Pfizer more? Um, my answer to that would be they're both incredibly safe, incredibly effective. Whichever one you can get, you should get. Um, and I wouldn't have a preference for one or the other. I got Moderna. Um, my 16 year old son is, has had his first dose of Pfizer and um, neither one of us have turned into mutants yet. So safe and effective and the johnson and johnson as well we have three very safe three very effective vaccines so if you don't have a choice i wouldn't have qualms about recommending any of the three vaccines yeah i i would agree with that i think um you know when, when vaccine was was more scarce um i would just say the best vaccine i would kind of echo dr fauci right the vet, best vaccine is the one you can get um now um we uh we have uh, three very good vaccines. So we are in the very fortunate position of being able to look at all three, discuss with our, our healthcare providers and choose the one we think works for best for us. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any final questions? I just put a link to our YouTube channel in the chat, and that's where we will post this informative talk. Um, either tomorrow or Friday, we'll get that up after we do a little bit of editing. Um, our goal at Gateway Science is to try and do uh, a talk like this every month for the next few months. So we might have some other faces and voices being able to share with you um, as we go through this um, public health crisis and, and try to wrap it up. So. Um, thank you to Dr. Klein and Dr. Lewis for spending this hour with us. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, I think everyone on the call uh, or the meeting has learned a lot. Thank you. Any last minute questions? You're getting some applause. I wish you could hear it in person. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much.